Hi there, my name is Ray Gaucher, and welcome to this edition of Bible Break. As we explore one of the most fascinating chapters in all the Bible, chapter 5 of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, better known as the Beatitudes. I'm really excited to bring this to you because if you are a new Christian, or maybe someone who has, I wouldn't say backslidden, but maybe someone that's cooled off in your walk with God, this is a great way to recharge things. It's, it's a real beautiful reminder of what God expects from us. And I think this is something that chapter 5 is absolutely amazing. Need I say more? Um, this is going to end up being a, a two-part mini-series because you just cannot, you can't jam this all into one episode of, of Bible Break. I can't. Uh, there'd be too much that we'd, we'd be missing out on. So, also, I want to make it very clear that as we read through this, I'm going to read through uh, chapter, well, chapter five, obviously, but we're going to read through um, one. We're going to read right up to verse 21, and then on the next episode of Bible Break, we'll f we'll finish it up. So, I'm going to read through it first, and then we'll go back and recap it, and I'm going to share with you what's on my heart regarding. Um, these verses and of course I want you to know clearly I'm not a pastor I'm I, I never went to seminary what I'm gonna be sharing with you is whatever God puts on my heart all right so why don't we open up with prayer dear Heavenly Father thank you for this opportunity to read your word thank you dear Lord for um, this opportunity to share this and Lord I pray that what I read will minister to those that are listening and it would encourage others, Lord, to do exactly what it is said in here, what you expect from us. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. And I also want to share with you guys, I apologize for the background noise. Um, I've got the, I'm in my truck, I've got my air conditioner going, it is very, very hot where I am, so I, you should be able to hear me fine over, over the fan or the air conditioning that's blowing in here through the sleeper, but it is extremely hot in here, so um, there's no way I could do this with the air conditioning off because I'd be just, I wouldn't be able to see the, the, the Bible in front of me <laughs> because it would be all, all wet because uh, it's, like I said, it's very hot out there. So if you all ready, gee, did I just say y'all? If you are all ready, I guess I'm spending a little too much time down south, we can begin all right chapter 5 Matthew oh by the way I'm, I'm reading out a complete Jewish Bible if you would like to read along with me uh, BibleGateway.com you can find the complete Jewish Bible on there or, or you can follow along in your own translation <coughs> but I do recommend you follow along with what I'm reading it'll be easier for you to uh, to follow along there you go so Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 Let's begin. Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. After he sat down, his Talmudim, his disciples, came to him and he began to speak. This is what he taught them. And I love the way that this translation says this. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted, because they pursue righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed you are when people insult you and persecute you and tell you all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. Verse 13, you are the salt of the land, but if but if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except being thrown out for people to trample on. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, when people light a lamp, they don't cover it with a bowl, but put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Verse 17, don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah, which is the law, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. Verse 19, so whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvah, which is commandments, and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Oof. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We'll get back to that one. That is a very powerful verse, that one. Verse 20, for I tell you, and so is this one, unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Purushim, which are the scribes and the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom, <coughs> excuse me, the kingdom of heaven. All right, so that's verse up to verse 21, and now we're going to go back and recap what we just read. All right, let's start with verse three. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Someone asked Billy Graham, what did Jesus mean by we ought to be poor in spirit and shouldn't we strive to be rich in spirit? Graham brilliantly responded with the following. What did he mean? Simply this, we must be humble in our spirits. If you put the word humble in the place of the word poor, you will understand what he meant. In other words, when we come to God, we must realize our own sin and our spiritual emptiness and poverty. We must not be self-satisfied or proud in our hearts, thinking we really don't need God. If we are, God cannot bless us. The Bible says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And you'll find that in James chapter four, verse six. Also, when I think of poor in spirit, I think of, and, and again, Graham said this very well. We replace that poor with humble. Did you grow up with a very humiliating lifestyle? Were you a bit of an outcast when you were a kid? Did your parents, or were your parents the poor ones on the block? Didn't have the fancy car that the Joneses had? Um, you, your neighbors went on camping trips every summer, but you're lucky if you could play in the next door neighbor's yard. Um, maybe you just ended up with a bad education. Just a very, very humble lifestyle. But are you rebelling because of it? No, we've accepted it. And I remember growing up as a child myself, as not in a very, very uh, humble way. Uh, I was ridiculed a lot when I was a kid, simply because we didn't have what the other kids had and we couldn't partake in what the other kids did, hockey practice and hockey this and whatever. Uh, we just couldn't afford that. And, but did it make me uh, an angry child? No, it actually made me the person who I am today. And, I, and I'm grateful for that. Um, grateful that uh, I, I don't want to say, oh, I'm a humble guy. Look at me. I, I don't want to say that. I, I'm just saying that living a life of humility really did shape me into the person that I am. And I, and I like who I am. And I like what God did to me and who he turned me into and shaped me into. All right. Verse two. How blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Uh, I can tell you firsthand that when we lose something very, very special in our life, um, God does comfort us. When I lost my daughter, that tragic, um, tragic case uh, three years ago when she was murdered, um, it was very difficult. And, and I still think to myself now, how did I get through that? And because the case has not been uh, brought to court, the person has not been caught. It's still investig they're still investigating something. I don't know what they're doing. You can't get closure. So the mourning continues. Um, so I mourn. There's, a, there's mourning every day, but God comforts me through that. He really does. And if you're mourning through the loss of a loved one or maybe a, a child or a broken relationship um, or even mourning the loss of what's going on in our countries, 
when we see what's going on in our countries right now, it is mourning. When you mourn, you're mourning because something is missing. Some you've lost something. Uh, something is is painfully missing, and. I see it all around me when all over when I drive throughout the country you can see it when people's faces they're just sad on what's happening with the country they're constantly mourning if you have the Lord in your life he will comfort you he says it right here how blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted it's a wonderful promise how blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land According to Christianity.com, meekness is a humble attitude that expresses itself in patience, uh, in, in the patient endurance of offenses. Gentleness is a practical synonym. It implies mercy and self-restraint. Meekness is not weakness. Sometimes we confuse the two, but the difference between a meek person and a weak person is this. A weak person can't do anything. A meek person, on the other hand, can do something but chooses not to. I really like that. The word meek from the original language was used to describe reigning in a stallion. It is the idea of a horse being controlled by bit and bridle. The horse is choosing to submit to authority. That is meekness. It is power under constraint. Again, meekness is not weakness. It is power under control. As the writer of Proverbs says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. And you'll find that in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. Verse six, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is also another wonderful promise. These are all promises. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you hunger and thirst to do the right thing, but you find yourself doing the opposite all the time? I'm living proof of that. Remember, Paul said, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. But God can see your heart. God can see my heart. God can see all of our hearts. And He knows if we're really striving to be righteous, if we're really striving to do the right thing, to be honorable towards him. He will bless that. He will give us that. As it says, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You will receive that. You will receive righteousness. And some might say, oh, you want to be so righteous. No, it's not that at all. We just want to do what's honorable and we want to do what the right thing is. We want to be law abiding uh, in, in, in the sight of our God. And that's what we strive for. And we should strive for that. How blessed, verse 7, How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be, for they will be shown mercy. This is another very self-explanatory verse. If you're merciful towards others and kind to others, it will be given to you. Uh, being merciful to somebody who you see maybe on the street, who's, who's asking for money, uh, for food, if you don't want to give them money because you think it might go to something else, then go buy them a sandwich. Um, offer to bring them in to, to buy them a sandwich and a drink or something. Uh, you can be merciful even by simply, I, I know these are really probably lousy examples, but this is just what's coming from me. Um, you can even go to an animal shelter and, and adopt an animal that has been through a very rough life. Uh, we have two cats that we adopted and it took over a year for one of the cats to even come around me. And you know that that poor cat has been through a lot. That's showing mercy. God gave us these creatures. They gave us, God gave us these animals for our pleasure. And there's a lot of animal cruelty out there. And people don't think of it as a big deal. But God is sad about that. God loves everything. He loves animals. If we love animals, He loves animals. Because we are made in the image of God. If, if I mean, He comes back. It says when He returns, He comes back on a horse. He loves it. I'm pretty sure God loves animals. <clears throat> so be merciful towards other people, the less fortunate, um, maybe the disabled. Do something for them. The, 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 the widow and, and, the, and the orphan and volunteer time at a, at a, at a shelter and, and, or a soup kitchen. Just These are just small examples. And you can even be merciful to somebody who has uh, maybe borrowed money from you and you know they can't pay it back, you can show 
wonderful mercy by going to that person and say, you know what, I know you really want to pay this back, but I know you can't, so I'm going to forgive you of this debt. That's showing amazing mercy. Um, those are just simple examples. But again, blessed are those who show mercy, for they, they will be shown mercy. God will show mercy towards you during a very important time in your life, possibly judgment time. And what I mean by judgment time, I mean when he's issuing uh, out our rewards. Verse 8, how blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When I read this verse, I always think about um, a friend that I had when I was about 10 or 10 or 11 years old. He was 18 years old. He was Down syndrome. He was the best friend I had. He was fun. He just wanted to play, ride bikes, go to the swing set. Not a, not a improper thing came out of his mouth. Nothing. He was 18 years old and you'd never know it because he acted like a little boy. And he was completely pure and innocent in heart. You don't have to be uh, mentally challenged to be pure in heart. You can be pure in heart simply by what you say and the example you show around other people. Don't. Uh, look at inappropriate things. There's things on TV that we can choose not to watch because what goes in comes out. Um, if we're around people that talk inappropriately, that every second word is, is, a, is foul language, don't associate with people like that. Be around people who talk about the Lord, who read their Bible, who talk about positive things, good things. Um, I, there's plenty of times I remember when I was, when I was younger and I worked uh, on construction sites because we used to do electrical work and you would hear the foul language and you would hear the inappropriate thing where guys every second word out of their mouth is a cuss and all the jokes that they had were dirty jokes and you should have seen what I did last night and I went to the bar and I did this and I did that and I was with this girl who needs all that I mean that's the sort of thing I just like no I don't want to hear it and there's nothing wrong if you're in a group of people that talk like that and you and you say I, I gotta go and someone says well what's the problem there's nothing wrong for standing up for your faith and just saying well I'm a Christian and this sort of this sort of conversation uh, disturbs my spirit and um, I think I better go and if that is a real friend, they'll apologize. If they are not a friend, they'll probably laugh at you. But who cares? Who needs friends like that? Who needs friends like that? Strive to be pure in heart. And the best way to be pure in heart is to read this. Read the Word of God. Get into the Word of God every single day. And enjoy the beauty around us. I always find that when I go take walks and I see birds, I enjoy the birds. The other day, or should I say the other hour, I just seen a wild turkey walking around with her little babies. And it just, just brings joy to you. You're not thinking anything inappropriate when you see stuff like that. So, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I, these are probably really lousy analogies, but <laughs> I'm doing my best. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, verse 9, how blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. If you have an issue with a friend, a loved one, maybe your spouse, even if it's not your fault, go make peace. That's what God wants you to do. Go make peace. Um, have you ever been in an argument with somebody and it just eats at you all day long? And the Bible says, don't, don't go to sleep. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let uh, a situation be, resolve a situation before you go to bed. Even if you're right and the other person is wrong, what would be, there's nothing wrong with you going to that person and saying, you know what, I really don't like how things turned out. I really care about you. I would, really would like to put this stuff behind us. It's, you know, it's not worth, you know, having um, this, this, um, this tension between us. And you know what? That other person is probably going to say, you know what, I was wrong. I actually, I was the one that was actually wrong and they came forward to make peace. And, you know, that's going to be a different, that's going to make a difference in their life because they're probably going to know you're a Christian. And if they don't know, you should probably let them know so they can give God glory for seeing how you reacted to that situation. And they might even say, I wonder what that person's got. I want that. I want that. Verse 10, 
How blessed are those who are persecuted for they pursue right because they pursue righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And we could actually uh, line that one up with uh, verse eight. How blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness. Because we want to do the right thing. We don't want to do the things of the world. And people aren't going to like us. We're going to end up being an outcast. If you're in a group of people and you don't want to hear the foul language, you don't want to hear the dirty jokes, you don't want to go to the bar tonight, you actually really want to spend time in the Word um, or spend time at a church service or a Bible study or just watching a really good movie, you know, something clean, and you just don't want to partake in what they're doing, you're probably going to be ridiculed. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, I don't think there's one person on this planet who stands up for God isn't persecuted because that's the way the world is. There's so much evil and lawlessness around us. It's just simply going to heaven or going to happen and you're going to go to heaven. <laughs> How blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful promise. How blessed you are when people insult you and persecute you and tell you all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. Again, that can go with what I just discussed. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. Yeshua is saying, this happened, you're not, this, this isn't the first time this has happened. You're not the only one this has happened to. Persecution has been going on for thousands of years. Anyone that stands for truth, anyone that stands for God is going to be persecuted. It's just going to happen. Unfortunately, until Yeshua, um, until we end up in heaven, we have to deal with this. We just have to deal with it. There's persecution going on constantly, tribulation going on constantly, just because we don't see it in our neighborhood or we don't see it in our own country. But it is happening. They're trying to shut down churches because of COVID-19, but yet they're allowing people to fly in an airplane, 300 people at a time, but they won't let people sit in a church. You know what I mean? It's just, it's crazy. So the persecution against the church, against the body, is it's here, it is, it is here. All right, verse 13, you are the salt of the land. What is salt used for? Preserving. We are the salt of the land. But if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? If we're not expressing and showing what we stand for, which is God Almighty, Yeshua, if we're not preaching the gospel, if we're not sharing with our friends and our family what the Lord has done in our life, we're not preserving what the Lord has taught us. You are the salt of the land. But if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except being thrown out for people to trample on. Remember, you are the salt of the world. It is our responsibility and our job to preserve what the Lord has taught us and to share the gospel, to share the good news. And it goes hand in hand with verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, when people light a lamp, they don't cover it with a bowl, but put it on a lampstand. I'm not saying stand on the top of a hill and shout the gospel. Maybe you can do that, but you can certainly make your light known by, say you're, 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 uh, you're heading to a coffee shop after church. Put your Bible right on the table. Put it right on the table. Make it a conversation piece. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of your faith. You just never know. What's that? Is that the Bible? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm, uh, I've always wanted to, to read that. And then there's an opportunity for you to share the gospel. Uh, again, uh, people don't cover it and uh, co cover the light with a bowl, but they put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. The good things that we do, we don't do it for self-gratification. We don't do it so people will praise us. We do it so they will praise our Father. They will see the goodness in us. They will see the strength in us and they will praise God and they will want what you have. It's gonna come a time when things get really rough in this world. It's coming, we're in the last days, where people are gonna see the strength that you and me and others have in the church, in the body, the Christian body, and they're gonna want, how are you handling this? Why don't you look scared? Why don't you look worried? And then we have an opportunity again to share 
why and what we have inside. All right, verse 17. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah, which is the law, as I said, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not until everything that must happen has happened. So likewise, uh, so rather, so whoever disobeys the least of the mitzvah, which is commandments, as I said, and teaches others to do so, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is sobering. This is sobering. So whoever disobeys the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so. So you, there's others that teach you to break the commandments. It is. You've got political leaders out there that are standing for things that are completely against God. And they're saying it's okay. But whoever obeys them, the commandments, and so teaches, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of where I'd like to be. I want to be remembered. I don't even want to be called great. I just would like to say that one stands for Yeshua. Um, I will be put in whatever place God puts me in. I'll be very humble just to be the doorkeeper <laughs> at the great city of Jerusalem. I'll be happy for that, with that. Verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Purushim, which is the scribes and the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is very, very... I remember reading this and, and hearing this when I was an early Christian, and I thought, how on earth can we get into heaven then? These people, the scribes and the Pharisees, I can only imagine when Yeshua said this, and all the people listen to this, um, but the scribes and the Pharisees are holy men. They pray every day, several times a day. They sacrifice in the temple and, 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 they, and they, they read the holy scripture in the, in the synagogues. And these are holy men. How can we exceed their righteousness? But Yeshua knew their hearts. Yeshua knew that they were doing it for the glory of men to see them, what they were doing. They were getting, and Jesus said, they have their, <coughs> excuse me, they have their reward by simply saying, look at me. How I stand here and pray and show everybody how holy of a man I am. They weren't doing it for God. They were doing it so men would see them and give them glory. This is why Yeshua said this. He knew their hearts. He knew the scribes and the Pharisees' hearts. That He knew that they weren't doing any of this for God's glory. They weren't doing this to impress God. They were doing it to impress men. So again, he says, for unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers, the scribes, the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine if the scribes and the Pharisees heard him say this? And they probably did get wind of this. What a thing to say. How does he know? <laughs> How does he know? Well, my friends, there we are. On the next episode of uh, Bible Break, we will complete chapter 5, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, 21 down to 48. On the next episode of Bible Break, please join me. God bless you all in the name of Yeshua. Bye for now.